This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design and development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 374, Neurodiversity. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today we're talking about neurodiversity with Matthew Saunders. Matthew started working on the web all the way back in 1995 at an experimental dance company in Ottawa, Canada. We're going to have to ask more about that. This became an obsession with bleeding edge technology. His decades of experience in the technology sphere as a project manager and web application architect segued into joining the Drupal community in 2007. He has spoken at a num uh, numerous DrupalCons and Drupal camps. Matthew was on the DrupalCon Denver Organizing Committee, is chairperson for Drupal Colorado, was uh, on the association board, and helped found the EOWG, the Event Organizer Working Group. His day job is at Pfizer as director of technology uh, as the healthcare provider portal delivery lead. Matthew, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm interested to jump into this topic. But before we do that, I'm John Picosi, Solutions Architect at EPAM. And today, my co-hosts are Nick Laughlin, founder at Enlightened Development. Good afternoon. And Randy Ost, Creative Director at Four Kitchens and Product Lead of Emulsify. Happy to be here once again. All right. And now to talk about the module of the week, let's bring in Martin Anderson Klutz, a senior solutions engineer at Acquia and a maintainer of a number of Drupal modules of his own. Martin, what do you have for us this week? This week, we're going to be talking about a module called Views User Term Filter. It allows you to filter the results of a view to ones that share a taxonomy term reference with the current user's profile. It was created earlier this year, back in July of 2022. It currently has an Alpha 2 1.0 version available that supports Drupal 8, 9, and 10. Uh, doesn't have any open issues, and it's actually only currently in use by two sites, but maybe the show will change that. Um, as I mentioned, it's a module that I made and, and really was is designed to try and demonstrate the power that Drupal has to, um, to make a site feel more customized, especially if it's a site that has kind of authenticated users. The idea being if you're showing a list of information, then you can narrow that down to, to information that aligns with something that a user has specified on their profile. So it could be, you know, what region they're in, you know, if they've indicated a primary interest, those kinds of things to be able to, to help make the, the site content feel more, more custom to, to what you know about them. So wanted to maybe open this up to the group or for these kinds of use cases, you know, what kinds of solutions have, have people been using uh, before this module is available? Typically I would do some sort of like, configuration node, right? Or or object or something where it, it might be on their user profile. So it still kind of looks like they're editing it there, but it's just some sort of like, this is some sort of entity that holds some fields that has some configuration. And then you just built a view to react to that, that information. Um, but it seems like this is, I, I, I guess my main question is how, my question always with these types of utility modules is, is how how strong are the assumptions? Can it work with multiple vocabularies? Can it be multiple? Can they choose multiple taxonomy terms? Or is it really just meant to be you have one category that you want one vocabulary that you choose, and they choose one value, and that's how it works. So again, because it is a, a newer module, I would say that that the initial use cases were really more around kind of the, the simple use cases. But um, that being said, if there was a need to um, to make it work better with more complex use cases, then by all means, you know, would love for, for somebody to, to throw that in as either a bug report or a feature request and, um, would, you know, I, I think it would be excellent if it could work for a variety of use cases, not just the simple one that it was originally written for. Absolutely. It's interesting. I recently had a, request or a, or a need uh, in a project to kind of gate content based on certain attributes of that content. 
and um, determined that taxonomy was the best way to, to do that. Uh, this this module definitely is something that would have um, uh, come in handy um, or or could have come in handy when I was kind of looking at that. I think I used um, like more of the taxonomy access permissions uh, module set to, to resolve that problem. But um, this this module definitely kind of fits into there where where, you know, I can set a, a term for a user, or a couple of terms for a user and and kind of gate content for them. So that's definitely another use case. Yeah. When I was setting up the use case, I had actually hoped that maybe I could use a token to sort of achieve the same thing. But in, at least in my experience, I, I couldn't get the token approach to work. So I uh, rolled the, this into a module. I think this is awesome. Anytime we can add some personalization to an experience for users, um, it's it improves the experience for users. Um, so I, I love the concept. Thanks, Martin. If you have a suggestion for module of the week, uh, let us know on Drupal Slack in the Talking Drupal channel. Now let's jump into our primary topic. So Matthew, before we dive deep into neurodiversity, right? Um, this is something that, you know, a term I've heard of, um, I mean, I don't think I'm as, as familiar with it as I should be. Can you kind of give an overview of what is meant by neurodiversity and, and being neuro, neurodiverse? Sure. Um, I should start by saying that everything I talk uh, about here is my own thoughts, my own ideas, and they don't necessarily reflect the opinions of my employer. Okay. Um, stated. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, People are different, right? They've got different capabilities, different talents. Um, and neurodiversity is the range of differences in brain function, behavior traits. Um, it's generally regarded as part of the normal variation in human population. However, in this context, it's used to, to talk about folks who have attention deficit disorder, dyslexia, autistic spectrum disorders and anxiety disorders. So it's sort of this, this notion that people, people um, um, consume, th uh, consume the world around them differently. Um, and there's this notion of what's normal, but it's a, it's a spectrum. So there's this normal range right in here, which most people, you know, 80, 80% 80 of people fall into. And then you've got a range outside of that center where 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 people are considered neurodivergent or neurodiverse but the whole idea is that everybody is a little bit different interesting so and and it 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 sounds like it encompasses a wide variety of of um, of things. Uh, you know, I don't want to call them necessarily. Well, maybe they are disorders. I mean, what, what's the what's the appropriate terminology there, Matthew? Yeah. So a lot of people have moved to the the term learning differences, right? When I was when I was a kid, um, they were called uh, learning disabilities or learning disorders, and that's kind of fallen out of uh, out of uh, um, you know out of out of style um and mostly i think because because people are trying to be as as uh, as inclusive as possible and the idea that somebody's disabled um is is a is a pretty is a pretty um it can be a pretty sort of shocking notion right um okay. most people most people don't want to be referred to that way most people want to be um seen as whole whole people um regardless yeah. of what kind of challenges that they've got in their lives I just have a question about like, uh, you were talking a little bit about like language and that got me thinking like, you know, I know a lot of um, individuals with disabilities, there's typically like a people first language kind of situation, like mm -hmm. referring to, to, to someone um, as like, you know, uh, I, I'm blanking on any example. The only example that's coming to my mind right now is the deaf community, which does things both ways, uh, people first, as well as also like, you know, um, disability first, but I'm wondering, like when it comes to neurodiversity, like, um, what are some terms to like say with that? Like, do we say that a person has ADHD? Do we say that a person has autism or is autistic? Like how, how do we, we talk about that? That's a really, really good question actually. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that you brought it up. There's a lot of nuance to it. Right. Um, so first off, 
Um, ADHD isn't really a thing any longer. It was removed from the DSM a number of years ago. So uh, everybody, everybody who has this whole whole notion of ADHD, which is um, uh, which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, has been it's all been sort of um, rolled into the ball of ADD, attention deficit disorder, and um, the hyperactivity stuff came in mostly because of uh, little kids and uh, their their uh, their propensity you know when they were weren't able to concentrate so so well uh, of bouncing off the walls and so a label was added to 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 that to, to that particular particular situation however i'm going to give you a concrete um, example of of uh, of how to think about um, referring to folks with different kinds of neurodiversity, so um, the whole whole uh, whole uh, notion of Asperger's syndrome came from the research of a guy, guy by the name of Dr. Asperger, who was part of the Third Reich, and they were doing experiments on on uh, on on children at the time, sometimes euthanizing them, but until recently, the details around that weren't weren't uh, weren't made weren't public so there the the whole idea of aspergers um was in fashion to 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 uh, uh, refer to people on the autism spectrum who were high who were high functioning autists right and and when this when this whole notion of what uh dr asperger was actually doing came out it created this uh this almost a rift and um the the whole Asperger's um, diagnosis got rolled into autism uh, uh, the autism spectrum uh, at that point. Now there are a lot of people in the uh, in the Asperger's uh, uh, community who don't like being lumped in that way because there is a notion that somebody who's got autism. Um, uh, may not be as uh, hi highly functioning, may not be as uh, as capable, or may be more different from a neurological standpoint than than uh, than other people. Um, so you need to listen really carefully to people in in the in the community as to how they want to be uh, referred to. So, for example, if you hear somebody who says they're neurodivergent and they're on on the autism spectrum, you you should you should re refer to them. In that in that uh, in that way, you shouldn't refer to them as being uh, in uh, you know having Aspergers. But if you have if you, if somebody uh, come, you know approaches you and they and they and they uh, and they again I'm neurodivergent um, and uh, but I'm an Aspie, they they're making a very clear statement to you how they want to be referred to. So I would liken it to to um, how how we're we're uh, referring to gender these days, right? It's a very similar sort of dynamic where where uh, people want to be able to identify in the way that they want to identify with, and they want people to identify them in that way. Um, and it's totally okay to ask. Yeah. I, like in, okay. in my in my brain, sorry, Nick, in my brain, I just had this like, I don't know, I don't know if I want to call it an epiphany, but I just had this like light bulb go off where it's like, you know, people uh, when in education, right. People are classified as like visual learners or audio learners. Like this feels just like an, an expansion of that where people could be, um, you know, need, need the information in a certain way or a different way in order to be able to understand it better. Is that, is that a fair analogy? It's absolutely true. That's uh, what, yeah. uh, what special education is all about, right? It's about helping kids who, uh, who, who may be extraordinarily intelligent learn in different ways. Um, yeah. as, a, as a good example, I still don't know my times tables. I've never learned them. Um, and, but I've got tools that allow me to, to get around those, uh, those kinds of deficits. Um, has it affected my, my life as a professional in any meaningful way? Absolutely not. I I am with you on that one. I also would like to interject there a little bit. Like to me, it just feels like education. Like I don't know that we need to label it as special education, but that's that's a that's a different yeah. thread, I think. Sure, sure. But but let's 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 be clear that when when a kid needs uh, uh, accommodations around the way that they're being educated um, in 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 our system in the United States, um, you go down the path of getting an IEP for for your for your kid and Absolutely. all kinds of things for those accommodations. Yeah. Right. And remember, 
I'm I'm a I'm a product of my generation, right? I'm a Gen Xer, and uh, um, I, I accept the fact that maybe special isn't the right word, but um, but it does it does encompass way 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 more than than uh, than you might think. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would I, I would I would say that the you know when you're dealing with like gifted and talented as well, that's special education. It's it's yeah. catering to a specific need. Yeah, it, it, exactly. It, and going back to kind of the classification discussion too, I think one of the th one of the important things is it's very difficult to work through things if you don't have a language, a common language to talk about um, something. So like if you're trying to find the best way to um, serve a population or best way to be functional in your job or, or whatever you're looking for, having that classification, that language, even if it's sometimes imperfect, is helpful because you can... Um, you can build a, a language around it, but on some level too, people people can advocate for themselves too. So what you were saying, Matthew, like however people identify, you know, might change from person to person, and people can self they can advocate for how they want to be identified. And there's no substitute for finding out how, you know, how an individual might want. But you know, as a group or as a class, like having that language, you know, as it's been, you know, it's it's evolving. You know, it's not, you know, people, people didn't come up with the perfect way to name stuff in the beginning, but having some way to talk about it, is, and this is true in programming too. I mean, I'm, I'm literally dealing this with this with a client right now. We have, you know, you're building a bunch of different components, you kind of throw them together. And then at some point you go back and go, okay, we called it an href here and we called it link URL here and we called it link dash URL over here. Let's have a discussion about whether or not we should be consistent or if they really should be different names naming is hard that's true whether it's in how you identify yeah. or in programming <laughs> i think i want to i want to clarify my point too it wasn't that like i don't believe in special education like i, I very much do i just feel <laughs> like we need to change our norms to say like it's education and like whether you need to learn in this way or you need to learn in that way or you have you know you need some sort of uh, help with how you're learning like we should just be like more inclusive, I guess, instead of kind of sectioning people out. It was all I was trying to get at. And that's that's absolutely a valid point. Um, when I was uh, when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, um, I was identified with uh, a reversal problem, um, with hyperactivity, with uh, with an opposition problem, um, with an with a with a uh, with a um, short term memory problem. All kinds of things that we've got better labels for now. And what 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 happened to me was I was uh, because they they had no way of dealing with a kid like me. Um, I was an experiment, and I was put in both the remedial program and also the gifted and talented program at the same time. Um, and yeah. what this practically meant was I didn't fit in anywhere. The kids uh, the kids who were in special education. I uh, didn't want to have anything to do with me because I was I was uh, in the gifted and talented program and vice versa. And the normal kids never had anything to do with any of those groups. So I ended up uh, going through my life because of those boxes that you're talking about, John, um, e extremely lonely until I got to university. Um, when when all of the people that were part of that stigma were no longer part of my life. Um, where, where I was able to start rebuilding who I wanted to be. Yeah. Um, so, so I hear you, I hear you loud and clear on that. Um, those, those kinds of things are tough. I, I, I think it, and we'll, we'll get back to the agenda after this, I think, but I think it really <laughs> highlights to the trope where people, you know, not having that common language is a hindrance as well. Cause you know, people, mm -hmm. You, you know, I have friends and stuff that sometimes will be like reading something. They'll be read, like, somebody will be like, you know, I have ADD. And they'll be like, these are my symptoms. Like, well, that's not ADD. I have those same things. And it's like, well, <laughs> yes, you should talk to a doctor. You probably, if you have those same um, struggles or same, uh, same, I don't want to say symptoms, but same, you know, behavior patterns or, or, or things that you have to deal with, then there, there's now tools to help you with that. And, and having that language helps people realize about themselves too. And the, and the truth is that those morbidities uh, overlap between different, different, uh, different yeah. kinds of, of issues. So it takes, it takes uh, some, some real, um, some real um, introspection, of, you know, yourself, but also um, working with somebody who a professional who really knows these things yeah. in order to identify um, the right path to go down. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. 
Uh, so, so if we we take a step back for a second, Matthew, what got you interested in neurodiversity? Oh man! So I touched on it just a, a few minutes ago, right? When I was talking about uh, being part of the part of the uh, remedial program, part of the gifted and talented program, and all of that. But I mean, the fact is that I've known since I was small that I was different. And back then, it wasn't called neurodivergence, right? Um, it was called learning differences or learning disabilities. Um, and my my uh, my issues were 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 serious enough that. Um, I was legally entitled to accommodations from the Canadian and Ontario governments. And this is back in the 80s. Like the, the, the idea that you'd be entitled to accommodations in the 80s um, um, is, is sort of nuts. So that, that sort of, I lived with that for, for a good chunk of my life. And it went through high school and, and then through university where I sort of stumbled my way through. Um, and then a number of years ago, um, quite a few number of years ago, um, we, uh, we, uh, I, I ended up spending a good chunk of time researching my daughter's own challenges. Uh, we adopted her from social services um, at the age of five, and her experiences uh, that she, she came to us with um, were, pretty, were pretty rough. Um, and and that, that led to me to, you know, to read and going to classes and seminars because I really needed to understand as much as I could about her own neurodivergence so I could be her advocate. Um, and during this research, I had light bulb after light bulb after light bulb go off in my head because I was recognizing things that I was learning about in myself. And I was just like, it was, it was, it was just like, like these, these, these fireworks in my brain. Um, so if in a very real way, if it hadn't been for my daughter, um, I would have just continued coping and I wouldn't have known that I had ADD or dyslexia. And I certainly wouldn't have understood, um, come to the explosive realization that I was personally on the autism spectrum. So all of that led to my, my really wanting to dig in and, and learn as much as I possibly could about neurodiversity, neurodivergence, um, coping mechanisms, those kinds of things. And this, I mean, this was purely like outside of like your day-to-day, -day, your day-to-day -day job and work, right? You were doing this like of on course. your own. Yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. of okay. course, of course, because we were in a, in a situation where, where my daughter really needed accommodations and uh, the school system wasn't providing her with what she was honestly legally entitled and uh, entitled to. And um, um I, I needed to build up enough ammunition that um, that either either they were going to say yes or or they were going to find themselves in in a legal entanglement. Right. Um, and uh, um, I'm a bit of a nerd, like a lot of us in in uh, in tech are. Right. And and yeah. what I found was I ended up nerding out entirely on this stuff. Um, and, uh, um, you know, uh, it's, it's led to, it's led to some pretty, pretty awesome experiences talking to other people, doing, doing, uh, doing talks at, uh, conferences like DrupalCon and, and Drupal camps. And, uh, um, and the reason that you reached out to me, John, on this, uh, the series of videos that I'm doing right now, short videos that I'm doing right now on, on YouTube. Which is something that I wanted to ask you about. Um, I can you tell us a little bit about that video series? Um, it's it's called what? My neurodivergent brain, right? Yeah, it's based it's based originally um, on the the talks that I've been doing at conferences, right? Um, and and what I found um, in the conferences was that the 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 uh, the the nuggets that did the, the points that I was going through, like anger, joy, um, oppositional behavior, um, those kinds of things. There were different people who had different reactions, good and bad to, to the different areas of that, of those talks. Um, and I also found out, you know, from folks that I was talking with that, uh, that they, they found it, uh, difficult to keep up over the, over the entire, you know, 45 minutes hour, um, around, around the, the different areas that I was, that I was talking about. So what I've done is I've, I've broken up the concepts that I've been, that I've been discussing for the last three years and I've, and I've bundled them into, uh, into four to eight minute videos. The idea okay. is that you can, you can go in, you can find out about one thing. Um, and, and, uh, and, and you don't have to, you don't have to spend a lot of time on it. You don't have to invest a lot into it and you don't have to have a ton of background around it. Um, and, and, uh, um, 
uh, it's very new. I've only been doing it for about two months, um, but I'm hoping I'm hoping that uh, that uh, that it helps folks out there who who found themselves in you know so similar challenges as my own. We'll definitely put a so, link to that in the show notes for listeners who want to check that out. Now, the the videos, are they geared towards people in technology or are they more broadly applicable? So I think they're more broadly applicable. But the fact is, um, I come from uh, because I, I come from uh, from a, uh, a, a, a tech background. Uh, almost everything that I do is wrapped within the context of of uh, of technology. That said, um, there is a, a, a lady uh, who runs a Facebook group called uh, what, in, what in the ADHD, um, who's been very, very interested in in uh, in in the, uh, the the stuff that I've been that I've been doing on on that YouTube channel. They've been gracious to allow me to post in their private private group um, and so on. Um, so I feel like, despite the fact I approach life as a technologist, the general, the general learnings, um, and are applicable to pretty much anybody out there who, who might find themselves on the spectrum or, or have uh, ADD or, or, uh, dyslexia. Just out of curiosity, this goes back to something you said, um, a few minutes ago about you, you giving talks and, and people, um, uh, you know, uh, enjoying them or, 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 you know, having good reactions and bad reactions. I'm just curious what the bad reactions were. So I think it's sometimes hard for people to recognize, um, in themselves as they're, as they're, as they're emerging, um, in terms of their own, own self realizations. Um, so like a little uh, bit of denial. I think there is sometimes. Yeah. Sure. Um, um, you know, you, you, uh, earlier on, um, um, it was said, you know, I, I, uh, I was talking about my ADHD, uh, uh, symptoms and, and, uh, and, um, you know, my friend said, no, there's no, no possibility, right. I've got those symptoms, right. Like there, there's, there's a lot of that out there. Um, and, and people don't want to be labeled, Right. People want to be seen as 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 being as being especially young people, right? So I look at my daughter's uh, my daughter's uh, uh, cohort. She's twenty two, and there's nothing worse at the, in at that age than being seen as something different than than your peers. Um, there's a strong desire to fit in and uh, and not not be not be different than 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 other than other folks. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, there, 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 there are folks uh, outside that, uh, out the, outside that spectrum, of course. But I think in general, people want a tribe, right? And they don't want to fall too far outside the boundaries of that tribe. Yeah, I, I, I will say though, I think you know, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I do feel like that's definitely true on an individual level. Still, I, I think more. As a community, though, because people are talking about it, it really is being destigmatized too. Absolutely, so it's not, absolutely. It's not perfect, but it's definitely. I think it's definitely moving in the right direction. People are more willing to get the help or that they need, or or even learn. You know, look for resources, that kind of thing. A absolutely, that's why I do these things, right? Um, I I came to the conclusion. You know what? I'm pretty secure in my career at this point. I've been doing doing my work, the, this kind of work, for nearly a quarter century. Um, um, I'm not going to find myself self in a position where I'm not hireable because I talk about um, my own my own life experiences and I uh, and I talk about the kinds of things uh, that that uh, that um, I'm uh, the, the kinds of things that I think other people experience as well. To the extent that at at, uh, at work at Pfizer, um, they they asked me to do a keynote um, for the for the uh, for the. Uh, um, entire entire digital um, um, practice at the at the uh, at the organization during one of our during during one of our internal conferences just on this topic. Um, so I do think that there's a whole lot of effort to to destigmatize the whole whole notion of what neurodiversity is, what neurodivergent people are, um, and 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 I think a big big part of it is that um, lots of lots of people are realizing 
that they that they may nibble on the edges of it, right? Um, because it is a spectrum, um, and uh, I, I think that helps for folks to know they're not all that different than one another. Yeah, you're not alone. It's funny. I yeah, always and- I always come back when we talk about topics like this, and I and I I know we've talked about you know accessibility topics in the past, and I you like we're all just people, and we're all, we're all different. And we all need to be more accepting of the fact that we're all people. We're all just different, but. Yep. I agree with that. The more we talk about it, the more it normalizes and the more it normalizes, the more people are okay with like, you know, uh, becoming or acknowledging that they're part of like whatever groups, you know, or like, you know, like it's, it's comfortable to be able to say I am neurodivergent in this way. Whereas maybe like when we were kids, it, it, you know, that was something we weren't going to do. Sure. Sure. So this is a Drupal podcast, um, as indicated by the title. Um, I'm interested to hear, um, if you could tell us some of the ways, you know, neurodivergence applies to Drupal, um, and, and the community. Sure. So I'd start by saying that, um, it's estimated that about 1% of the population has autism spectrum disorder. And then when you, when you move into the, into the, uh, uh, the software development industry, you move into tech that jumps to roughly 4% of us self identifying, right? This isn't the people who, 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 um, um, who haven't, haven't realized it or, or, uh, or have, uh, or, or are, are masking and don't want other people to know. 4% are self-identifying. Um, and then, then when you take a look at uh, the population around ADD, 4.4% of the population has ADD. Again, that jumps uh, to about double that when you're, when you're talking about the, uh, the, the uh, tech industry. And I would, knowing a lot of technologists, I would say it's probably quite a bit higher than that, right? But again, this is self self identification. And then finally, um, roughly twenty percent of people have dyslexia, and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, those those uh, in those circumstances, uh, a lot of us didn't even realize it until we were quite a bit older, and that also jumps um, uh, when you when you get into the tech industry. Now. What I'll say is that uh, that f- folks like myself, uh, who who are artistic, who who have been successful in school and have managed to to uh, build the coping mechanisms around um, how to how to work with others and live in a um, a uh, neurotypical world, um, a lot of us do gravitate to industries like software development, and because of our our nature of wanting wanting um, a tribe it's also very common for us to to gravitate to open source communities so what i see um, and this is this is purely anecdotal my working within open source in the dribble community what i see is this sort of concentration that's occurred right um, of really really smart people that don't quite fit in um, in in the rest of the neurotypical world um, but um, I think I think that with a little bit of understanding and a little bit of effort, um, both from the neurotypical standpoint and the neuro- neurodivergent uh, standpoint, we can we can put ourselves in a place where um, we all understand one another much much better and uh, and uh, and can work together in really really creative and positive uh, positive ways. So that's a long way of saying um, the Drupal community is 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 a concentrator. It's it's a it's a it's a place where a lot of us have found a home, and a lot of us may not even realize why we found the home that we found. Hmm. I'm I'm definitely glad to hear that. I, I'm curious though, you know, if we can we can spell some of that out. So as as a community, how can we help neurodivergent folks? You know, not just um, you know be comfortable, but participate, be part of the community. How, how can we help? Yeah, so there's so 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 many ways, um, um, and more than I can talk about during this particular uh, um, uh, chat. But um, and and I'm going to add that I can I can speak to my lived experience, um, but I think my lived experience is common common to others. So let me touch on a few things. Um, 
I, I'm going to start with anger. Um, my experience of anger is different than than the experience that other people might have uh, with anger. So for me, um, my feelings of anger are almost never directed personally towards another per person, right? Um, I may be angry about a situation. I may be uh, angry about a circumstance. Um, and, and until I learn to cope uh, and 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 uh, and rein in those angry feelings. They could come out as extraordinarily oppositional outbursts, really, really disruptive, really difficult for other people to understand. However, when those feelings fade, and they ha that ha can happen incredibly quickly, um, there's no feelings that I have of animosity towards the person or people that it might seem that that anger was uh, was directed towards so that can be extremely confusing for 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 the person who who thought that i was angry with them or the people or the group of people um because they can't understand how somebody can you know do a 180 so quickly it's also really conf confusing for somebody who's neurodivergent like myself because they can't conceive of why somebody's still upset with them after they've let go of the uh, of the irritability um so it, so I think when you're when you're when you're um, when you're working with people on the spectrum, please consider that their feelings manifest differently than than other people's might. Um, they feel deep, deeply about things that you wouldn't expect necessarily that they fe feel deeply about. Um, and I think that it's super important to avoid approaching this as an overreaction. So if you say to somebody who's upset, who's neurodivergent, you're overreacting. All you're going to do is is add fuel to 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 that fire under certain circumstances. Um, it'll make the the uh, the, the situation um, even more challenging, and 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 it makes it makes the person feel like those feelings are less valid or real than than uh, at least in the opinion of the person that's talking to them. So for me, I, I found that it's totally fine for somebody to say, "Hey, what's what's up? What are you feeling? Why do you feel that way?" And I'm totally happy to talk about these things as long as those feelings aren't being dismissed. So if you're in a long-term personal or professional relationship with somebody who's neurodivergent, you, it's, it's really helpful to learn what triggers them and are, are likely to lead them to these extremes. So you can help an awful lot just by understanding, just by, by, uh, by uh, sort of um, uh, um, starting to get a sense of where those triggers occur. Another thing is that people's names can be baffling. To, to, to a lot of us. So I'm looking at the screen and honestly, I don't remember any of your names right now. Um, and, and that, that isn't, that isn't because, um, I, I, I don't want to, but names go out the window completely, particularly when you're under stress and, and, uh, and overstimulation. I can even forget the name of a close friend. Um, crowds freak me out. There's just too much stimulation. I get anxious just going to a uh, a shopping mall. I find it exhausting uh, meeting new people, figuring out how to negotiate those relationships. Um, so if I'm going to be in a situation like that, I'll often um, pick one person who I know and trust and I'll say, keep an eye out for me. I'm uncomfortable and I may need a way out. So if somebody on your team is on the spectrum and they say to, the, say you, say to you that they're experiencing too, too much stimulus, believe them. Help them get to a quieter place. Um, lower lighting can help. And really, really don't be offended if they if they if they can't remember your name. If they ask you to remind them of it, of your name, just tell them it's not it's not anything personal. It's just it's just just the mm -hmm. the way that the brain is wired. For me, it's the same with books and TV shows. Um, I, and I I recognize faces immediately, but putting putting names to faces is really 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 tough. So I want to dig into this a little bit because you said a couple of different things there that um, they were all, they were all great and provided great insight, but I want to, I want to dive into a couple of them. Um, sure. And then the first, the first one I think is um, work relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So you talked about having, you know, obviously as we all work with people, we develop relationships with people, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about how you, uh, how you manage, uh, your, your, your feelings, your, your, um, your neurodivergence in a work setting. Is it something where, you know, 
you tell your fellow coworkers, like, this is, this is kind of how I roll or is it, um, you know, is it something that you, uh, just kind of handle on a case by case basis? So to answer that question, I have to go back to my, uh, late teens and early twenties. Um, so I met, I talked a little bit about, um, a little bit about my experience, uh, with being, both in the the uh, the uh, special needs program and also in the in the uh, um, gifted and talented talented program and how that experience followed me all the way through high school. Why did it follow me all the way through high school um, to the end of high school? Because all the kids that were in the same middle school as me moved into 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 the same high school setting. And despite the fact that uh, that uh, um, um, at least most of the educational learning needs had been dealt with by the time I got to high school. And I, and I b- built up uh, coping mechanisms and, and uh, strategies that would allow me to be successful in high school. Um, none of that stuff went away. Um, and, 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 uh, I, I, and, and a lot of it I pinned directly on myself. I pinned directly on my own behaviors. So there's a period between finishing high school and going to university. It was about two years where I just went, I, I, I don't understand why, why I don't have friends. I don't understand why I make a friend and then they're, they're out of there. They're, they, they, you know, they, they have no interest in, in sticking around. Uh, and I I was unbelievably lonely. So what I did was I, I, I got myself, um, a bunch of notebooks in every interaction that I had. If it was good, I wrote down what I did, how I behaved, what it was that I was thinking, um, and, and what the outcome was, if it was bad, I did the same thing. And I did that for about a year and a half. And I started analyzing what, 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 what behaviors elicit the positive responses that I want, what behaviors elicit negative responses that I don't want. Um, and for about a six month period before I went to university, I, I experimented with, with, uh, with those, with those assertions, with those, uh, with those, uh, um, observations that I had, uh, that I'd, uh, put down to paper. And I found almost, almost, almost to, to a fault that, um, I discovered a formula for making friends and building relationships, which I then applied at university. And, um, I'm pleased to say that, you know, when I got there, I flourished, I had lots of friends people liked me. It was the first time in my life that people had liked me. Um, and, and that is, that's basically in my professional life. Now I, I, I use those tools. I use what I learned, uh, because, I, because I was a very sad and lonely person in my late, late teens and early twenties. So I have to ask, please share what's the secret what's the formula to making friends, the secret oh. to success in life. <laughs> so, so dude, if you, if you really want to do what I did, it, it's it's hard work. You have to be you have to be absolutely brutal with yourself, and you need to write it down. When things don't go right, write it down. Write down what you were doing, what you were thinking. Um, there there is no special special magic wand. I can't like, you know, sort yeah, of. Yeah, no. <laughs> but I I think you're right. It's one of those things where whether you're neurodivergent or not, like that amount of effort that that thought into your own personality and reactions and actions to, you know, the people around you is something that a lot of people don't go through. Um, and, and frankly, a lot of people could <laughs> stand to go through, I, um, but it's work. Like you said. I will, I will say that, um, Matthew and I met uh, on the event organizers working group, uh, board and, um, uh, knowing Matthew for uh, you know a year plus now, I find it very hard to believe that he never had friends. He's a very likable guy, very easy to talk to. Um, so you know, uh, clearly you've you've worked on that, and and hopefully that that helps others that maybe maybe having that that um, that issue and, and might need that help. One other thing I wanted to touch on, um, you had mentioned that. Uh, you're not comfortable in groups. They, they kind of maybe stress you out a little bit, but yet at the beginning of the show, we talked about how you speak and uh, attend the Drupal camps and Drupal cons. 
how how do those two things kind of uh, work each other out? Well, first of all, after I get back from an event, I turn into a hermit and I curl up in a little ball and I recharge. Um, I find them exhausting. So say we all. I, I find them exhausting. And it's not that I don't like people. I do like people. Um, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's that, it's that negotiating. I, so, so I think part of it is, um, I never learned, I, I don't have, I don't have the instinct of cause and effect. Okay. It was it, for me, cause and effect is a, is a, has been an intellectualized learn, learned, learned behavior. Um, I didn't realize as a young, you know, as a youngster, if I did, if I did action a, um, that, that, uh, that it would cause, um, um, B to occur, whether it was good or bad. So in my life, I'm constantly circulating in my brain. I'm about to do this. What is that going to mean from my experience? I'm about to do this. I'm about to do this. I'm about mm -hmm. to do, and it happens extremely quickly now. But I, I have had to intellectualize all of this as opposed to, as opposed to um, understand it instinctively. And I didn't know that other people did weren't doing what I was doing until I was well into my my uh, my late twenties, early thirties, where I was like, "Wait, what? Most people, this just comes naturally." Can you um, can you so, elaborate but, on that just a little bit? But but, but uh, sure sure so. So, um, and, and the reason that I'm actually, let me, let me finish answering your first question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that I do when I get up in front of people is, is first of all, um, after about 30 seconds of speaking, a literally a veil drops down and I'm no longer that as, 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 as aware of people as individuals. Um, when I'm when I'm speaking, that's the first thing. The second thing is, if I decide I'm just not going to think about cause and effect during that period of time, um, I don't worry about what people are thinking, or what they're doing, or whether they're leaving the room, or whether they're they're shuffling their feet feet, or whether they've decided that that, that they're going to look on, at their phone instead. It's, it's, uh, it's almost, it's almost like a, an altered state that I, that I end up in, um, which is the reason that I can, I, I can get up in front of, uh, of many people, um, and, uh, and talk, um, and not really feel, um, f feel particularly nervous. So I'm, I'm curious. And, and if this is, um, if any of this is too personal, feel free to let us know, and we, we can shift we can shift gears a little bit. Um, this isn't um, that type of show where we just dig in too deep. But as you're talking about this, I'm curious about the podcast itself. Like, is this a is this a similar situation? Like, if if you're not physically in a room at a camp, is it as stressful with just you know three or four guys on a podcast, or is it um, is it different for you? It's all the same. Hmm. So I want to go back a little bit to the um, cause and effect part sure. of that conversation, right? Sure. Because I personally find myself always like, okay, I'm going to make a joke. Like what, how's that going to be received? Or I'm going to do this thing. How's that going to be received? And thinking it through and kind of going through that and, uh, you know, I always assumed other people did it, but it, people don't. Is it different? If is it different for you? Like uh, people don't. Uh, uh, most people don't. Most people. Most people instinctively understand um, the, the how their behaviors are going to affect other people. Um, most people. Most people don't intellectualize it. Um, so. I, 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 at least that's my experience. That's, that's, you know, from when I've talked to, to folks about it. Um, I, I, th I think it's interesting. It sounds exhausting. It, 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 I think, but it, but it becomes automatic. Yeah. I, I think one of the things I can really apply to directly that people might have some more direct experience with is something like stand up comedy, right? People think like, 
you see a comedy special, you think that the person just stood up there and decided to be funny for an hour, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't they don't realize many times, and unless they watch some sort of documentary or have a friend or something, they don't realize that these comics, before they have a stand-up special, they're each one of those jokes they've tried six, seven, eight hundred times to all different audiences. And they've tried one time with a pause that's three seconds, and one time with a pause that's 10 seconds. They tried this word versus that word. And and they literally sit there with each other and talk about, okay, what makes something funny? Like, what is comedy? What are the different tropes of jokes? And and um, it sounds like what you're saying for uh, neurodiverse folks is that you kind of have to apply that same thing to other interactions, not just like, I'm trying to be funny. How do I make a funny joke? But sometimes it's also like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to go to the cashier. How do I handle that interaction mm-hmm. um, without being super awkward or super angry or, or or whatever you need to process? Yeah, for sure. So, so I would, I would I, hmm. again, emphasize, reemphasize, this is my lived experience, right? Yeah. I'm not going to speak for any other person who's got to, who's, who's neurodivergent, but I have heard other, other folks um, who are neurodivergent say, Hey, that's what I do too. Hmm. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right. Let's say as an example, I'm at the butcher's counter and, um, and using that grocery store um, uh, sort of analogy, I'm at the butcher's counter and um, a lady um, butts in, in front of me and, and I'm in a bit of a hurry. Right. And I start to feel some anger, not towards the lady, but towards the situation that I am getting later and later and later. And time, time is another thing altogether. Um, I'm, I'm, I've got what's called time blindness, um, which is a, a completely, completely different conversation. But uh, time, time is stressful for me. The whole notion of time, I don't really understand it. Still don't understand it. So I'm sitting there, and I know that I all I need is is to get is to get the those uh, those chicken drumsticks, right? And and I need to get out of the store. Um, you can find yourself winding up, winding up, winding up, winding up, winding up. And by the time you get to the cashier, you could very easily take all of that angry energy out on that cashier. As I'm walking towards the cashier, as I'm walking towards that line, I'm thinking to myself, okay, um, what if, what if I, what if I go to, to the first cashier instead of the third cashier? Is that going to be any better? Um, looking at the different cashiers, looking at what their what their the the, the presence is about them. Um, okay, I'm going to choose number one. Um, now, as I'm as I'm approaching the cashier, um, what am I actually going to say? What is going to get the best reaction? Um, how how do I best diffuse myself and ensure that I don't make somebody else's day bad? These are things that I think about. That I don't just internalize and 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 feel. They're things that I think about, um, and 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 uh, and you know, do the do the scenarios. And by the time I get to the to the cashier, I've figured out the scenario that I want to engage. And all of that goes back to my my late teens, early twenties, writing all of this stuff down, because back in my late teens or early twenties, I would have just been a jerk. And, and, um, and I, and I know, and I know that I, and I've seen it, I've seen it with other people who haven't taken the time to figure out, um, why it is that they have problems with relationships in their lives. Right. It's yeah. because it's because they, they haven't taken the, taken the, uh, the time to be introspective and look at how you can engage in getting positive outcomes. And, and I would bringing this back to software for a second. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit like if then statements, right? Yeah. I, I, I live my life with if then statements. Hmm. Interesting. So uh, thinking of the like grocery store example, like, you know, you've got your experience going through that. Um, 
kind of flipping it around and thinking about it, what can the grocery store do to like improve the experience for neurodivergent people? And to bring it back to something more specific to this podcast, I'm thinking about like websites and like I can do accessibility testing. I can test for like uh, making sure that there's like inclusive language. Like what kinds of things can I do to, to help with current common like neurodivergent like issues on websites? Yeah. So in general, there isn't testing that you can do. Um, if you're engaged in good accessibility practices, you're going to cater to many of the uh, many of the the needs that neurodiverse people have already. However, here's yeah. an interesting little tidbit for you. Okay, uh, the you. National Library of Medicine um, reports that eight percent of males have colorblindness. Um, then, when you take a look at the the, uh, the folks on the autism spectrum, that jumps to roughly thirty percent. Oh wow. wow! We don't we don't really know why, um, and this was discovered in like 1992 or 1993. Um, so, using myself as a as a as an example, I'm red green colorblind. Now that doesn't mean that I don't see colors. It doesn't mean that I don't see red. It doesn't mean that I don't see green. But deep deep and dark greens and reds look the same to me. Um, and then and then if you're looking at a screen where somebody's got blue on red or red on blue. And yeah. everybody around you is saying, wow, that pops. I, that makes it so obvious what I'm, and I'm just sitting there going, I can't see that at all. <clears throat> so, so one of the things that you might want to think about is, is, uh, is um, uh, when you're, when you're dealing with uh, a neurodivergent uh, population, can you tone down your colors? Can you make your contrast yeah. really, really, really clear? Um, um, um and, and again, this all comes back to good accessibility to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, wow. as, a, as a fellow red, green, colorblind person, <laughs> I can give an example that people, um, that, that directly affects me. So um, the red and green in stoplights, oh, yeah. for, for, for especially <laughs> old stoplights, they look the same from far away. Yeah. Now, I know, you know, which one's on top, which one's on the bottom, but a lot of the new stoplights, they're like LED or something. They just have a different red and a different green. And no matter how far away I am, I can immediately tell whether it's red or green. And that's the um, reason that we can't be pilots. Yeah. Yeah, because they use red and green on the wingtips. Why couldn't they use like, well, <laughs> yellow or blue or something? But <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. coming back to coming back to websites and designs, like being creative director, one of the things that I do with my team is to make sure that not only do we do color contrast issues, but we also use a tool like uh, Sim Daltonism on the Mac that actually allows you to overlay over the screen and and see as if you were a colorblind individual, the mm. different types of colorblindness. So to make sure that like, okay, is this going to work okay for people with red, green colorblindness? Um, is there enough like contrast that, that like it can be distinguished? Yep. Yep. That's so, cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. We also have it baked into storybook too. Yeah, storybook um, has that. Yep. yeah. It's really nice. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious about, uh, the upcoming Drupal cons. Is this something that you're, is this a talk that you're working on, uh, there? Do you have a talk accepted yet or? Yeah, I don't think anybody has a talk accepted yet. Um, <laughs> what, what I'll say is that I've, I've spoken on this at two Drupal cons so far back in Amsterdam, um, and then in Portland and there were two different talks. Um, you didn't need to go to the first one to, to, to understand the second one or anything like that. But, but, uh, the first one really was my journey. Um, and, uh, it uh, started touching on, uh, my neurodivergence in that journey. Um, and it was really around, um, identifying when opportunities, um, uh, are there for you. And sometimes you don't, recognize them at the time and talking about how maybe you can recognize those opportunities a little bit better. And then the, the, the last one was, was really talking about tools and tips and how you can, how you can um, uh, live in a, a neuro neurotypical world a little bit, a little bit more easily um, and how neurotypical people can work with you um, to, to help you in, in that world a little bit easily, more easily. I've got a submission for Pittsburgh called an unexpected whistle stop tour in neurodiversity where, you know, I've been talking about all these little, these little percentages and tidbits and stuff like that. And one of the things that I started uh, discovering as I did that last talk is there are all kinds of crazy things that you wouldn't expect are connected 
that actually are connected. As an example, um, um, if you uh, if you um, have learning dis uh, uh, differences. Um, you are 80% more likely to get uh, testicular cancer than somebody who doesn't have learning differences. Um, and it hasn't been discovered exactly why, um, but, but it is, it is a thing. Um, it's hmm. also been, been shown that, uh, that you're, you're, you're four times more likely to, to die from it if you get testicular cancer. Um, hmm. If you're if you're if you've got learning just, uh, differences, so a little a little uh, a little uh, uh, public service notice here. If uh, if you if you are out there, you're a guy and you're neurodivergent. Um, every, uh, at least once a month in the shower, check your boys out. Make sure that they uh, that there there are no lumps and bumps because if you if you uh, catch it early, um, it is highly highly curable. Um, and I say that as being a 22 year uh, cancer survivor of uh, testicular mm -hmm. cancer. And that's one of the reasons that I sort of made this connection. But again, it's one of these things that they didn't figure out until the mid nineties. Um, yeah. So, so um, the, 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 the answer to the question is, I really hope that uh, my, my uh, talk is, uh, is accepted. Um, I think, uh, I think that it'll be fun to, to, for people to sort of get these wacky, wacky connections between hmm. different kinds of uh, different kinds of uh, um, learned dif differences and things that you would think are completely unrelated in your, in your, in your life. Um, and I'll pull it all back together. If I'm able to do the talk, what I'll do is I'll pull, I'll use that as a nugget and I'll pull the, the stuff that, uh, that was in the first two talks into it to sort of finish what I hoped would be a trilogy of talks to begin with. Okay. I'll be there. That'll be great. Uh, I, I agree. Um, and is that, a, I'm assuming that's a topic that you're bringing into the, uh, the video series as well. Or? We'll see. Um, okay. the, the video series right now, I know exactly what I want to talk about. Um, all of the video has been, has been, has been, uh, has been done. It's not all been cut. Um, I've got one more in the can and I need to, I, I've got three more that I need to, that I need to edit. Um, uh, but I think that when that particular series, my neurodivergent brain is done, I'll probably start another, another, uh, another group of videos after that. Um, and I'm not sure what they're, what they're going to be yet, but it's not going to be like a never ending series. The idea is that these sure. are, these are limited, limited series that yeah. will talk about different things. Yeah. Wacky night neurodivergent facts. Maybe, Saunders. maybe that's what it'll be called. There you go. So I got a, I got a, like pie in the pie in the sky question. Um, if you had a, a magic wand and you could, you could, you know, globally improve something for neuro neurodivergent folks, what would it be? Oh yeah. So I think the number one thing is early education. Um, oh, you know, okay. the, the, the earlier, the earlier that, uh, that people, um, are, are, are put in a situation where they can, where they can, um, learn, learn new, new coping mechanisms, learn, learn strategies to, to engage in tasks and in relationships in all kinds of things, um, the better the outcomes are, um, um, and, uh, and sadly, sadly, early education, um, at this juncture isn't doing enough. Um, I don't think to, to help kids who, who teachers might look at and say, I know exactly what's going on here, but the, but the price per pupil, um, triples when you, when you, uh, when you engage in certain kinds of accommodations for a kid mm. and, and, uh, school boards have limited budgets. So that's the reason that a lot of parents end up having to struggle and end up yeah. having to fight to get to kids their the accommodations that they, that they are legally, legally, uh, um, you know, the legally, legally should be getting. So b before we close out the show, I kind of have one other question too. Um, Representation matters, as we've been kind of talking about during the show, but for, for both sides, you know, representation matters if you're neurodivergent because it helps you see that you're not alone, but representation matters also for people that may not identify as neurodivergent because it helps build empathy and understanding as well. Um, sure. I, I'm curious if there's any anything in media like TV shows or movies that are, you know, particularly good representations that you've found um, if somebody's kind of curious about that. 
Oh, that's a super good question. And of course, you've asked me a question that has memes in it. Um, oh, sorry, you mentioned that. That's <laughs> awful of me. Um, well, it, I, l- so, let me let me let me change that. Let me ask about a specific show that I that I particularly enjoy and see if it's if it's a good example. And that's um, Atypical is a new show on. Um, uh, well, I guess it's not new anymore. It's three or four years old now. Netflix about somebody that has is on the autism spectrum. That I, I don't know if you're familiar with that show. I, again, I'm doing I, it. I'm, I'm doing it again. You don't know yeah, names. So. Yeah, yeah. But, I, I I don't I don't know the show. Actually, when you name something, that's different than asking me to remember a name. Ah, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but but I haven't but I haven't watched it. Um, there was oh, just recently I watched a show that thought was really good around this but it's not coming to me right at this moment i'll i'll, I'll follow up with you okay okay um that works. On, on that i think also nick uh, and i don't know because i've never watched the show but i think the uh the good doctor um on i don't know what it's channel a, it's on it's okay it's okay all right all right i just i it's, just knew that it was kind of yeah, like in that yeah. space of the question yeah, I mean it's a bit of a parody, and they don't mean it to be. Hmm. Um, oh. um, okay. I mean they they don't. I, and parody is the wrong word. What's the word that I'm looking for? Um, um, it 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 it. I think it exaggerates exaggerates um, um, the 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 experience um, in a way that they're trying to make they're trying to make this this guy um, look highly functional and highly non-functional at the same time they're trying to to mix two ends of the spectrum in a in a in a sort of awkward way um and and um i i'm not entirely comfortable with it i stopped watching it yeah i and and i'll before we close out i'll just say why i asked this question and it it's because you know i think people when you watch media you kind of generally if it's not something you're familiar with you generally take it as at face value right you generally right. say like this is probably it's probably not perfect, but it's probably decent, right? But whenever you see something that's in your domain of expertise, you're like, like if you ever watch like NCIS is famous for it. you watch anything <laughs> that's due to technology on NCIS, like they're hacking by both people typing on the keyboard at the same time. Yeah. Right? You, you just know like <laughs> yeah. okay, that's completely <laughs> absurd. And, yeah. and I just have to assume that the same is true. And like I said, we'll, we'll, if you follow up on with me on that, then we'll throw it in the show notes for the listeners as well. But um, yeah. I just wanted to to kind of set a set a baseline in my mind for you know what's good representation in media and what's not. Sure. Yeah, I can follow up. So um, just to kind of take us home. Is there anything else that you'd like to add, or any like final remarks that you'd like to make? Oh yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, appreciate that. So I think I think. Use empathy. Um, if you're on the spectrum, and I'm I'm not talking about just just fo- folks on the spectrum or sp- folks out, outside of the spectrum. If you're on the spectrum, though, you have to work twice as hard to understand mm. how others perceive the world. And if you're on the on, and, and if you're not on the spectrum, you need to work twice as hard to understand how your autist friend, colleague, or partner thinks. Make I, mean, I think that people need to make patience central to their life. That was one of the one of the things that changed my 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 experience in the world um, in 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 ways that I can't even express. Um, so so make patience uh, central to your life. It's a muscle that needs to be exercised. Hmm. And those with ADD and autism become irritable more easily than atypical people, and that can lead to outbreaks of anger. So practically what this means, if you're neurodivergent, you really need to be monitoring what you feel, why, why you're feeling that way. And if you're neurotypical, you can really help your friend by watching out for warning signs and triggers. And finally, I think kindness, um, kindness should be your go-to even when you're upset. Um, people should assume that people are approaching a situation or a problem with good intentions and less unless they, they, they prove otherwise. And particularly in our, in our industry, I feel like that's, that's the case. And we end up having all kinds of miscommunication arguments in our community that could be, could be um, avoided, if not entirely, um, a great deal just by being more kind to one another. Yeah. That's something I can get behind. 
I, yeah. I mean, I think we can all, we can all get behind that. And I think those are, those are amazing thoughts and, and words to end on. Um, Matthew, I appreciate your time and uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to have this conversation with y'all. For our listeners, do you have questions or feedback? You can reach out to Talking Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal for now and by email with show at TalkingDrupal.com. You can connect with our hosts and other listeners on the Drupal Slack in the Talking Drupal channel. You can promote your Drupal community event on Talking Drupal. Learn more at TalkingDrupal.com slash TD promo. You can get the Talking Drupal newsletter for show news, upcoming Drupal camps, local meetups, and much more. You can sign up for the newsletter at TalkingDrupal.com slash newsletter. Thank you, patrons, for supporting Talking Drupal. Your support is greatly appreciated. You can learn more about becoming a patron at TalkingDrupal.com and choosing that button in the sidebar that says Become a Patron. All right. We have made it to the end of our show. Um, Matthew, if our listeners wanted to get a hold of you and uh, chat more about this topic or, or any topic for that matter, how would they go about doing that? So I'm at Creech on, uh, on Twitter. Um, and uh, you should feel free to contact me there. Um, also, if you want to email me, uh, you can get me at matthew at dogstar.org, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, at D-O-G-S-T-A-R dot O-R-G. Awesome. Randy, what about you? Oh, I am Amazing Rando just about everywhere on the internet, on Drupal, on Twitter, for as long as it's still structurally sound. Um, <laughs> and uh, I also have AmazingRando.com, the website, so you can always find me. Actually, that's a good point. With Twitter collapsing, I'm um, I'm also at Creech on Mastodon, um, and I've started to shift the shift some of my uh, some of my activity over there. Very good. There you go, Nick Laughlin. What about you? You can find me pretty much everywhere at Nick's Van N I C X V A N. And I'm John Picozzi. You can find me on all the major social networks and Drupal.org at John Picozzi, and you can find out more about EPAM at epam.com. And if you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. See you guys next week. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for having me.